This video will give you an overview of natural hazards. We're going to focus on tectonic hazards in this video and then the sequel will focus on climatic hazards. Okay, so first of all then we've got um, a map of the world here that shows you where the plate boundaries are. Whenever you get a question that asks you where um, earthquakes or volcanoes occur, the first mark will always be, be reserved for when you say that they occur on plate boundaries. You can then start to describe whereabouts those plate boundaries are and you can give examples of the different types of plate boundary. So for example, you could talk about the African plate and the South American plate moving away from each other at a constructive plate boundary. Boundary. This forms the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. On the other hand, you could talk about the North American plate and the Pacific plate um, moving alongside each other and a conservative plate boundary, or you could talk about the Philippine plate and the Eurasian plate coming together at a destructive plate boundary. Okay, so the Earth is made up of four main sections. We've got the inner core, which is the hottest part of the Earth, and it's a solid. The outer core, just outside it, is a liquid. After that we've got the mantle which is the largest section of the earth and that's where we find convection currents which are really important for the movement of the crust. And the final layer is the crust, the part that we live on. Okay, so why do the plates move? Well, it's all because of the convection currents you can see at point A in this diagram at the bottom of the uh, diagram. The convection currents are moving because when they're at the bottom of the mantle nearest the core, they heat, the liquid heats up. We know when something heats up it rises, so it rises to the top nearest the crust. When it reaches the crust it will cool down and then sink back down to the bottom of the mantle. So we've got a rotation of these convection currents constant, constantly moving and if they're moving away from each other they pull the crust on top of it apart. If they move towards each other they're going to pull the, those pieces of crust towards each other. Okay, so there's four ways that the plates can meet at a different plate, bar, plate boundary or a plate margin. Boundary and margin is the same thing. The first one we've got is constructive, when the plates are moving away from each other and this is, a, this is the example of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the plates move away from each other and so new land um, comes up through the middle in the form of a volcano because it gives space for the magma to escape. So it starts to rise up, we get volcanoes and we get the formation of small volcanic islands. The next one is destructive, this is where we get volcanoes and earthquakes happening as well as uh, constructive. Um, so we have the oceanic heavy denser plate sinks beneath the continental lighter plate. The oceanic plate has got ocean or sea on top of it and the continental plate will have land on top of it. So where they come together we have a subduction zone and we find that we often get volcanoes erupting here as well because there is a gap that able, enables the magma to escape. The Earth's focus is going to be within the crust and um, where the earthquake is actually happening. The collision map boundary then is when we have the two plates coming together in a collision. They don't form volcanoes but they do form mountains like the Himalayas, they're called fold mountains and it's formed when two continental crusts come together. So the difference between the collision and the destructive is that in the destructive we've got one oceanic plate and one continental and in the col collision boundary we have two continental plates coming together so one's not heavier so they both push upwards to create mountains. We only get earthquakes at these boundaries. Conservative plates is another example where we only get earthquakes happening, we do not get volcanoes. Um, it's when the plates are sliding either past each other in opposite directions or they're both sliding in the same direction but at different speeds. They become locked and one will break free. You can see in the diagram on the left that we've got the focus um, in the crust where the earthquake is actually happening. The point on the surface of the earth where we feel it the most, directly above the focus, is called the epicentre. And the yellow rings that you can see around that point are the seismic waves and they are the waves of energy coming out from the main point of the earthquake. A good example of this um, type of plate boundary is um, the San Andreas Fault Line in California. Okay, so how do earthquakes occur? Well, the two plates begin to try and move, they'll either slide past each other, towards each other, or away from each other. Um, in a conservative plate boundary, they, as they move past each other, their parts will get locked. The tension is going to build up and eventually they're going to give way at the focus point. Um, one plate now is able to lurch forwards because it's given way. Um, and the tension has been released so we get lots of waves of energy and these are called seismic waves. As the rocks settle into their new um, positions, parts of the crust, we tend to get lots of aftershocks which are generally smaller earthquakes. Okay, so if you have a look at this diagram here you can see the focus and the point in the crust, the epicentre is directly above it on the Earth's surface. 
Even though the epicentre is closest to the forest here, we would expect there to be more damage in the town and that is because there is more building there, it looks like more of an urban area and generally the deaths from earthquakes are caused by the buildings falling. The effects of an earthquake can be either primary or secondary. Primary are the things that happen straight away as a result of the um, earthquake and secondary are the effects that happen because of the primary effects. So some examples here then, we've got homes are destroyed, that's a primary effect. The secondary impact of that are that people are homeless and have to live in temporary accommodation. Another one is people are killed, so dead bodies are in the street and cause dis diseases to spread. The shipping ports might be destroyed, which means that we're not able to trade and there's a loss of income. The trees and buildings might block roads, which means the emergency services can't access the area. The power cables are destroyed, so we can't call for help because of the phone lines. And finally, the shop fronts might be damaged and destroyed, which can lead to looting, and that just means stealing. So some key words then, these are some of the effects of an earthquake. We get tsunamis happening, which is um, when we get a destructive plate boundary, the large ocean wave comes into the coast. We get landslides with the land slipping because of the vibrations. We get liquefaction when the soil is reduced to a liquid and um, because of all the shaking, and it means that things can get um, sucked into it. And finally, we've got shaking, so the, the vibrations of the earthquake. There are some ways that we can predict and prepare for earthquakes. If we're predicting, we can use the seismometer to measure the vibrations in the ground or the stress of the rocks. We can use the GPS, a geographical positioning system, to measure the movement of the ground. And we can have a look at past earthquakes to see if there's a pattern and we'll try and work out when and where the next one might occur. Um, however, it is very, very difficult to predict, so there's often no warning for an earthquake. In terms of preparation, we can build earthquake-proof buildings. I'll show you one in a second. Um, we can educate people on what to do um, and how to prepare using emergency kits. We can educate children on using earthquake drills when they practice like we would have a fire drill. Um, and we can train the emergency services to respond quickly and effectively. So this is an example of an earthquake proof building. You can see that we've got cross bracing which is the, di the diagonal um, enforced walls which means that they um, are a bit stronger. The same with the sheer core in the middle. It's reinforced concrete so it provides a really strong core. There is a base isolator which is uh, made out of steel and rubber and it absorbs all of the shock waves that come from the earthquake. And finally, we've got a moat around the base of the earthquake, and that means that when the earthquake happens in the ground, there is some space between the ground and the building for those vibrations and shock to be absorbed. A volcano then, well, there's three types of volcanoes. We've got active volcanoes, um, which are liable to erupt, like Mount Etna in Italy. Italy. We've got dormant or sleeping volcanoes that have not erupted for around 100 years, and extinct volcanoes that have not erupted for many thousands of years, like the one in Edinburgh. Different parts of a volcano, well the magma is going to be held in the magma chamber at the base and the centre of the volcano. Um, it's, if it erupts it's going to travel up the main vent, it might come out one of the secondary vents and cones or it might come out of the main crater at the top. Um, we often find we get the magma that comes out, that's within the volcano will come out and it will be called lava. We'll get volcanic bombs, ash, steam and gas and sometimes it's called pyroclastic flow if we get all of that coming out together. Shield volcanoes then are quite um, shallow and not and quite gentle. They're not. They don't have very steep sides, um, and they tend to not be that explosive. Strato volcanoes are the complete opposite. They are very tall and they have big explosions. An example of this is the Mount St Helens volcano that happened in North America. Um, and that blew off the whole side of the mountain because it was so powerful. These volcanoes are so tall because they're built up with layers of ash and lava. And finally we've got hotspot volcanoes like the ones in Hawaii. They are islands that are made out of volcanoes um, and they are generally likely to be made up of shield volcanoes. So quite gentle. People do live near volcanoes even though they're dangerous and there's lots of hazards associated with them. One of the reasons is because of tourism. If you're going to write this in an exam answer, you need to make sure you say some of the examples of jobs that, that will bring. So for example, people working in hotels and restaurants or as tour guides. So that's going to give them an income. There are precious minerals such as copper, silver and gold, so people are able to mine for them and sell them. Geothermal energy can be, used, can be produced um, with the heat of the volcano, which can reduce the cost of energy in those areas. Um, it, they're very good soils, fertile soils, which means we're able to grow crops, um, and so farming is a, a good um, economic income. 
And finally, some scientists live near volcanoes, um, seismologists, so they can predict and monitor the volcano. Different volcanic hazards, we've got lahars and mud flows, lava flows, volcanic ash fall, pyroclastic flow and volcanic gases. You need to know what each of these are. Predicting them, very similar to, use, to how we predict earthquakes, um, we're going to use a seismometer to measure the vibrations in the ground due to the rising magma. We're going to have a look at the temperature of the lava increasing at the surface because of the rising magma. We're going to have a look at the ground bulging because of the rising magma and we're going to have a look at more sulphur being emitted because of the rising magma as well. So you can see that all of these things happen because the, the magma starts to rise within the volcano. And we can also have a look at the past history of eruptions to see if there is a pattern. In terms of preparation, very similarly, we can evacuate people from the area so they can get to safety. We can educate people on what to do before, during and after, using emergency kits and evacuation plans. And we can train the emergency services to respond quickly and effectively.